All right. Good morning, everyone. And yeah, Jen, I'm just uh, stuck on good morning. There's no way around it. Uh, <sighs> okay. Good afternoon. Good evening. Whatever time of okay, day yeah. you guys happen to be catching this, either live as it already is afternoon on the East Coast or in syndication. And who knows, maybe you're watching this at two in the morning because you have insomnia and need to uh, be able to get back to sleep. Nonetheless, welcome to a, another episode of How I Met Your Mortgage. As always, I'm your host, Adam Smith, and with me is our co-host and one of our additional coaches at Just the Tips Coaching, Jen Weibower. Good morning, Jen. Good morning. All right, I can say that to you because it is morning where you are. It is morning currently, yes. Right. That's true. Okay. And we have a really special guest for you guys today, a uh, local to us real estate agent that uh, apparently we've been in contact with for years and years and have never had a live conversation before today. And we talked for a while pre-show and uh, we'll obviously talk some more, but welcome Andrew Goldberg. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> Hey, thanks for having me, Adam. Uh, super happy to be here today. Oh, no, we're ecstatic to have you, especially <laughs> after all this time. It seems really strange that we've done yeah. literally years and years of all manner of communication, whether it's voicemail, text, social media, uh, watching each other's video work, etc. And <laughs> that this, this last half hour has been the first time we've ever spoken live. Yeah, no, super exciting, and uh, it's, t it's the times that we're in the future. It, it is the it is a sign of the times, no question. Well, tell us about Andrew. I know that uh, we eventually want to get into you making a fairly significant and monumental shift in your business this year. Um, 100%. We, we know about that change, but give us some background. Um, we know you're from Illinois. Yeah. How did you end, How did you end up here? How did you get into real estate? Tell us about uh, Andrew. Ah, awesome. Yeah, so I grew up in Chicago, Northside, Burb, Skokie. I don't know if you're familiar. Um, you know, went to school in Indiana um, at Ball State. I had dreams of opening a concert venue, uh, did some music internships, um, wanted to, uh, you know, eventually become a concert venue owner. And I moved out here because the music scene was so vibrant. And there was this like urge during that time of like 2012, 2013, where everyone I knew wanted to move here and kind of start fresh. And there were so I had so many friends and we were all like not happy where we were in the Midwest and wanted to do something bigger and better. And there was this kind of big movement out here. So I just kind of joined that. Um, I also always loved Colorado. I was never a fan of the weather in the Midwest. So it was a really big bonus to come out here. And uh, back then it was really cheap to live here. So it was like, you know, cheaper living, better weather, uh, all these people that, you know, aligned with my vision to be out here and, and then also the music scene. So all those reasons just felt like the right time. And then it came to a point where, you know, that's not something I really wanted anymore. Um, the music scene was kind of changing and it just wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, and I found real estate through my brother. Um, my brother is a pretty good producer in Chicago, developer, uh, some sort. He manages a lot of projects, does a lot of new developments. And I'm in a family of five boys. So my, uh, my brother, Willie, um, you know, he was the one that seemed the happiest with his career. So I kind of flew off that. And one of the things I liked about real estate is, you know, I was drawn to it for not being in an office. I just could not, at that point, I had the, or I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Everyone in my family has that entrepreneurial spirit. And for me to work in a cubicle and nine to five and, you know, it was just not my thing. And the draw to real estate is that you could do it any way you want and there's no ceiling. Was part of the reason I was drawn to it as well. So I've always had this like vision of, you know, I love being a business owner. I love houses and I hate being in an office. And I feel like, I felt like those were the, this was the best job to connect those dots. Those, that is a, you, you nailed a bunch of things. That, yeah. And frankly, it's a lot of stuff we don't even really talk about on the show. Um, that the, the career opportunity in sales in general, real estate, mortgages, um, even automobiles, insurance, financial planning, on and on. There's a lot of room for flexibility. There's a lot of room for creativity. There's virtually no ceiling. And that's really an interesting piece that we never talk about. Um, but yeah, that is fascinating. So how long ago was this? Uh, this was around, I got my license May 1st of 2015. Remember the date? Um, I was super pumped. 
So I actually was so excited about I got my license. I got my license, left my house, and then drove to Vegas. Like first thing ever. So super, I was super pumped. You know, because I'd never had like a real, real career at that point. Um, you know, I was like an Uber driver. I was doing things to get by. You know, I came out, kind of came out here also to live more of a leisure-based lifestyle. You know, I was going to concerts, skiing, and just trying to do the Colorado thing while I was young. And then this was like that first moment where I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to have a real career. And I was just so excited. Still am excited about it, just in a different manner. Yeah, in the grand scheme of things, it's still relatively fresh, five, six years. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes you know, sense. Being, being 31, though, it's like a quarter of my life, or like 20% of my life. So, you know, on the scale of things, you know, when by the time I'm 50, you know, I'll be doing this for, you know, 60% of my life, which is going to be a crazy thought. That is crazy. a crazy thought. <laughs> that that yeah. I've been at it for more than half my life is already really, really bizarre. Um, yeah. Yeah, about half my life. Jeez. Okay, oh. so thank you to Andrew for making us all feel old. We're going to hang up on you now. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this has been an interesting episode. Uh, all right, so tell us a little bit about this change you made this year, because that's a really big deal, and I really think our audience, I think our audience in general, thinks about this a lot. Am I at the right company? Is this the culture for me? Are my splits what they should be? Am I getting the support I need? On and on. So I do think that there's a lot to uh, that our audience could benefit from being walked through what sparked the motivation to make a change, how the change went, um, how yeah. this year has been for you since the change, weird yeah. time to make the change. Um, yeah. But yeah, give us some insight there because it's a big deal. Yeah, I'll kind of walk you through the 2020 timeline. Um, just kind of because, so I started off this year in a really crazy spot. And I think a lot of agents felt the same way. It's 2020, 2020 vision, which I don't think is no longer a good phrase anymore. Um, you know, having that 2020 vision, I was kind of firing on all cylinders. I had, it was this, this moment where I finally had this crazy footing. I had a good reputation. I had endless clients. I couldn't even count how many clients I had. And, you know, things were just going out the charts. I was, and, you know, I had my best quarter, like right at the beginning of the year, and, you know, I was starting to get a lot of calls from recruiters, you know, people wanted me. I was getting headhunted pretty much once a week. I was getting a call that, you know, hey, have you thought about switching? And a lot of them are, you know, a lot of them are basic, but then there's a few big ones that were, they were really taking a big interest in me. And I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to leave just to leave for a split reason or anything of that nature. Um, where I was at was, you know, a family. We had a really good culture. Um, you know, I had managing brokers that were almost like father figures to me that was really, you know, they put me under their wing a long time ago and, you know, I have a lot of loyalty. So it was really hard for me. You know, I kind of pushed off the calls for a long time and just said, you know what, this is family. This is where I'm at. Um, and it started getting to the point where I was kind of outgrowing the structure because they were on a team structure where they did a lot of stuff for the agents, which is great. Um, but it was getting to the point where I wanted to do my own thing, kind of build my own brand, and also just have a little bit more freedom and flexibility of how I wanted to run things. Um, and also I was getting to the point where I was the top producer on this team and I wanted to get up and learn from people that were bigger and better than me. You know, I've always been told that, you know, you're, you're the equivalent of the five people you're around and, you know, if there's no one else to grow from, you know, it's, it was just one of those times where I was like, all right, I can't really grow much more here into what I want to be. Even though, you know, the mindset of everyone on that team, the culture on that team, it was all really great. Everyone was super supportive and we were a great family, but seeing a lot of these other agents making switches off teams and doing their own solo thing was very inspiring and very fulfilling. And, and it kind of came at a crazy time too, in the manner that, you know, they took a big interest in me and I was like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to do this during the pandemic. You know, I'm going to finish off here. You know, I have a solid core, um, but they stayed very persistent. And then, it came to a point where I had a moment where I was like, you know what, this is what needs to happen to grow. So, and there was a lot of signs and a lot of stars lining that, that showed me it was the right time. Um, and the, my other company was very supportive of it, more supportive than I would have ever imagined. And they knew it too. They're like, yeah, you know, our business model is not to, you know, maintain top producers. It's, you know, a lot of people leave and then go on and do something bigger. Um, just from being on a team standpoint versus doing your own thing, it's just you get to a point where you're in this box. Um, and where I went, where I went, Compass has been really phenomenal. Uh, it's been definitely a great move. 
uh, but it's changed my mindset completely. Have you switched mortgage brokerages before and gone through all that? I, the only change I've ever made in you know decades of doing this is going from being a broker at a brokerage, new career, to being a broker owner, and I've had my brokerage for 16 years. So that was the only change I'd made. It was uh, right before the uh, financial crash of yesterday decade. Uh, so a couple of years to get a business off the ground, and then a couple of years struggling through that. It was uh, difficult work, but uh, certainly very uh, rewarding. And it's funny because uh, a lot of our audience, a lot of our coaching clients ask me these kinds of questions about changing companies all the time. And it's not so much just changing companies, although that's a big part of it, but it's even the broker versus banker model. And in the mortgage space, the majority of mortgage originations is still retail in the mortgage banker space. I've always been a mortgage broker, which might account for 20% of the market right now, or 20% of the mortgage originations right now. But I've never done anything different. So I'm always at a loss for answers when people ask, should I you know, switch to being a broker? I'm like, I don't know. I've never been on your side, so I can't answer that. Um, I do know that there are obviously some very important factors, that it's a very personal decision, company culture, um, support. Do you need it? If you do, are you going to get it? If you get it, what's that going to cost you? Those kinds of things. There's a lot to weigh in there, and it's a very personal thing that people should take account of when they're making the decision to change companies, particularly in the real estate world. Um, but yeah, I am at a loss for being able to answer those questions in an educated manner uh, because this is all I know for 15, 16 years, all I've done is run my brokerage and coach other people on getting to this level. Um, so yeah, that's really been about the extent of it. So I'm kind of uneducated in that sense. But there are a couple of things that you mentioned that I really want to uh, focus on, or not focus on, but make sure that our audience really picks up on. Uh, one being that you never want to be the smartest guy in the room. And you said that about yeah. where you had kind of reached some sort of a peak or ceiling with your group. And yeah, all great minds, all great sales minds know, yeah, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you don't have anything to learn from the people that you're around. That's uh, certainly a big deal. And hopefully everybody uh, yeah. listening and watching understands that. Yeah, and it wasn't about being the smartest. It was more just along the lines of, I, I felt like I was managing my business more as a business owner uh, in a sense where, you know, a lot of people were sales associates, which there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but I felt like I had this more entrepreneurial spirit that I get just from being me, that I wanted to go take things and be on my own and be able to customize the way I do my processes and the way I market myself. And, and also just have a bigger like network of terms of support. And, you know, my managing broker, really amazing guy. Um, you know, just he did. He wasn't a producing agent. He didn't produce all the time. He sold a couple homes a year to stay, you know, in the game. But you know, versus learning from someone and being around peers that are selling fifty, a hundred homes a year as a principal agent, that those are the people I need to learn from. Um, not someone who's managing a team. Which managing a team is something that I've been thinking about. But at the same point, all the agents I've like looked up to and idolized from whether Denver or nationally. They're all solo principal agents at big companies, or they eventually start their own brand, and they're the brand. Um, they don't leverage, you know, they're like, you know, you have someone at like a luxury brokerage like Sotheby's, and they love, leverage that, but everyone knows them, you know, and all those megastar agents now, like Ryan Serhan, Josh Altman, all these people we're seeing there have that true no ceiling where they're accelerating, you know, have their own TV networks, shows, like all these things, and they're selling hundreds of hundreds of luxury homes a year. Um, you know, they're the brand. And it just became one of those things where if I wanted to go down the path of the people that I idolized, they all were been, they were all at one point a principal agent at some sort of big luxury brokerage at some point. That's, that's another really important point. But before we get too far down that road, and I do want to go down that road, um, I also want to uh, give kudos to your previous group. Um, I think it's yeah. really important the way that they handle the exit of people that just want more. And it seems to me, and it should to all of you that have 
agents under you, loan originators under you, whatever the case may be, that if you come across someone on your team, in your group, that wants to, in essence, graduate, matriculate to bigger and better things, then absolutely kick them out of the nest. This is proof positive that you groomed somebody to the point where they could and feel comfortable doing that. So kudos to you for being the teacher, the educator, the mentor, whatever your role is. If you have got somebody working under you that either wants to be you or wants to be better than you, wants to take it to a new step, a different level, a different path, then you should take some personal comfort, some satisfaction in the fact that you helped them get there. That's a very, very big deal. And it seems to me, Andrew, that the people you had been working with prior to Compass did exactly that. And that's how they treated your exit. Yeah. One of the things I kind of say about family is that, you know, they need to give you roots and wings. You know, they need to build you a good foundation and then give you the wings to fly. So, I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah, that is really cool. All right. So since we kind of went down this path, let's keep going down about how you as an individual Adam, when it comes to the core finance group, uh, it, that's the brand because um, we come across people all the time. Like I've you know, seen Bob at KellerWilliams.com and Bob doesn't have his own assets and Bob promotes Keller Williams and Bob Keller Williams does not need your help promoting Keller Williams. <laughs> what Bob needs to be doing is promoting Bob and Bob's brand and that Bob yeah. the real estate guy or Bob the mortgage originator, um, if it happens to be. Fairway is an example, Bob. Fairway doesn't need your help promoting Fairway. Bob should be spending his time and effort promoting Bob. Um, so tell us what that looks like for you in your recent wingspan. You know, what are we going to do in the rest of the year, in the future years, to promote Andrew, to brand Andrew, to build that brand rather than a compass or a peak. And I don't know if you even said peak. I had read that. So yeah. for those yeah, of you guys at uh, peak yeah. again, kudos to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know like, you know, with the pandemic and the shutdowns, you know, I had this original plan during 2020 to, you know, start, I had a food blog website called discover mile high, where I planned on interviewing local restaurant owners, local business owners and building a network that way. And just being that local mayor, uh, you know, but I had my first big like video shoot about to happen at the dairy block. And I got the Dairy Block to sign with me for my first show, which was like a huge thing. And they're like, nope, uh, you know, this is not happening. Pandemic, everything's shutting down. Um, and then, you know, at one point at the beginning of all this, we thought that the world was going to fall apart. Like the real estate market, forbearances, all these things. And it really had to come time to put your head down and, you know, build relationships, make sure you're there for people, answer any questions they have about the market during this lockdown and it kind of came back into like a regrouping phase during it to make sure that everything was going to be okay for our business when this was all done. But um, in terms of building my brand, you know, my core values that I've, that have got me to where I'm at now is I always try to be very prompt, personable, professional, and persistent for my client needs. Like whenever I'm doing something, I'm like, all right, following the P's, all right, being on it, all right, are responding to people, all right, being personable, all right, acting in a professional manner here, um, and it's came time to where, you know, when I treat clients, it comes down to, I, I always want a review and a referral and, and then build my reputation. Cause I know when you're younger in this business, you know, you kind of have to like kind of build really fast. And then eventually, you know, you have a client base, you have a network, you're not really worried too much about crazy lead gen. You know, um, it's more about building your brand and having the reputation and keeping it more than anything. But in terms of building my personal brand, it's going to be probably more video this year. Uh, it's going to be a big thing. Probably starting up to Discover Mile High website again. And then before I was doing a lot of events uh, in terms of like monthly happy hours, doing holiday events, all these things to, you know, be a member in the community. Um, but, you know, it's all kind of changed this year. So yeah, it's very kind of different. Along with the punches. And I, I think it's important to kind of give a brief insight as to what Andrew is dealing with, what we're all dealing with in Colorado that's or certainly in Denver that's unique to much of the country. Um, we're on fairly tight restrictions. We've bumped up another level as of late. Restaurants are on very tight, tight uh, restrictions for how many people they can accommodate, etc. And for those of you in, you know, Florida, 
Texas, Alabama, whatever, uh, we don't really do a lot of outdoor dining in December, January, February. It gets uh, cold here, so that's not uh, an option for us the way it is on uh, in the South or on the West Coast, so on and so forth. So, yeah, we're, we're definitely uh, staring down a fairly different animal than a lot of the country is right now. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it, kudos to the uh, restaurants uh, that have uh, made it thus far and hope you guys keep on going. Uh, I am uh, ecstatic to say that uh, doing a lot of takeout ordering is now good for your community and not me just being a lazy ass on the couch. I agree. La- last and year, it was me just being a lazy ass on the couch. And it's a, you know, it's a good time to support local business. And you know, whether it's even buying a gift card to use later, it's a very important time to do so. And shop local yeah you know coming Absolutely. off coming off small business saturday you know this last weekend and also seeing the resilience of these restaurant owners and these venue owners and the music industry all these people is definitely something that's made me really grateful you know i could be i feel like the pandemic is kind of like on a k where like I, there's certain people that are on the central side of it where things are booming business-wide and then there's the other side of it where everyone's going down because we're not doing the things we typically do so I'm very thankful to be on that side of it, and um, and it's good to be able to support those. But and seeing their resilience has been inspiring. It is inspiring. I would agree, uh, and hopefully we're able to see more and more of that as the uh, winter rolls on. It will be a uh, difficult season for everyone involved. So yeah. no question about that. But I do love this idea, and we do work on. Um, video campaigns with our coaching clients that don't have anything to do with real estate, but like interviewing local small businesses. In fact, one of our coaching clients does a video campaign, uh, Won't You Meet My Neighbor? And she interviews a small business owner uh, near her. Uh, uh, is that once a month, Jen, that she does that? Once a month. Once a yep, month. Once a month. Um, so yeah, really cool stuff. And of course, you know, this, uh, guys, I promise this isn't us, uh, telling Andrew what to say or coaching Andrew. Um, uh, mm-hmm. th- this is just a good idea, um, to help you embed in your community, get more involved in your community, help highlight your community. And all the while, the neat thing about the video work is that while he is doing this for these other businesses in his community, people are getting to know him, what he's like, what he's about, which is, you know, what relationship businesses are. You know, we talk about 80, 90 percent. The important content of getting out there is the who you are, not the what you do. Andrew knows that if there are people who don't know he's in real estate, he's already failed. He doesn't need to focus his time and effort on making sure people know he can help them sell their home. He wants to attract like-minded individuals. He wants to have real people in that he would want to spend time with, that he would want to walk through that process with. So really cool stuff, Andrew. It's nice to uh, hear people uh, talk about the things that we teach and promote and that (laughs) it's just good, solid, organic thought processes that are driving your business. Yeah, and it's been, you know, kind of a crazy switch to be now that I have a reputation, I pretty much have a lot of sales under my belt. I've been doing this for over almost six years now, which is crazy. And, you know, I came from a team that was very internet lead gen focused. Like that's what it was. You know, we were getting handed so many leads, couldn't even keep up, you know, huge databases, you know, and grinding out the calls. And that's kind of how I started my career um, was doing at one point, I think I was doing over a thousand calls a week to get off the ground. And then going from the, being a very transactional agent, still, you know, being a good guy, being relatable to now being this where I want to have a sphere around me that people I don't mind spending time with, people I want genuinely the best for them. And also starting young in this industry has been pretty cool is now, you know, the realtor for life thing could be where I actually share these moments throughout the life, you know, like where I'm buying my first home run, a lot of my clients are buying their first home. And I'm selling my first place when they're all selling their first place. And we kind of had this, you know, kind of shared experience where I get to relate to people on a deeper level than a lot of other agents. Would yeah, be absolutely. To. That's fantastic bonding. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I don't know if you had given this thought, although we certainly do recommend this to pretty much everybody that goes through it. And everybody eventually goes through it. Uh, one of our newest coaching clients is about to go through it. They're going to uh, uh, buy a new home. Uh, do some build out, those kinds of things. And to 
not video document that content for your audience when a lot of your audience is going to do the same thing, buy a new home, <laughs> is <coughs> ludicrous. Excuse me. But yeah, if you're going to go through the things, I don't care what industry you're in. I don't care what you're selling. If you're going to buy or sell, in the case of real estate anyway, the same thing that your client is going to buy, then absolutely, or your potential client, your future client, then absolutely document that process just to make it that much more human. Yeah. No, no. You know, I, I bought a place around five, six months ago. I've been going through the nightmare of a remodel. Like, Every horror story you could imagine has happened. And, you know, going through it with my clients and, you know, showing them along the process. And it's been pretty cool. But now there's parts of it where I've been leveraging my remodel to grow my business via Instagram stories, documenting it. And one of the cool things we're talking about doing, which I'm probably going to end up doing, um, is with Compass, you know, we have this concierge program. You know, we'll front you up to 5% of your equity to fix your house up interest free to sell your house, which is a unique value add that no other brokerage in town is doing on a large scale as a compass. So, you know, taking that and being able to show people what you can do before and after through compass, through my, even my own property is going to be pretty cool. That is really cool. Um, in fact, so cool that it really caught my attention. I actually turned and looked at you on the screen. <laughs> uh, repeat that for us, for our audience, would you uh, tell us about yeah, this program? So one the, yeah. One of the, one of the reasons I joined Compass, out of the many, many, many reasons, is the Compass Concierge Program. So what what we could do is take up to a 5% loan of your equity up to $50,000, uh, interest-free. Uh, we could bring in vendors, fix up the house, whether it's paint, carpet, uh, light fixtures, landscaping, you name it. Uh, we'll get your house ready, interest-free loan, um, and it's built into when you sell, you have to pay it back. Um, so it's really great for people when they're buying and selling because one, if they need to set, you know, get their house ready, it's a huge daunting process and what to do. A lot of homeowners don't know what's going to be the best ROI and also finding the people, the time and managing of it, you know, where I get to be, you know, for lack of a better word, more of a concierge for these sellers and do this all for them and kind of really show my value, um, getting their house really perfect for market and being able to do it the way that I know it's going to sell and get them top dollar without as much money into it. But also it's really great for these homeowners is they get more liquid while they're shopping for their next home. They're not putting 30 to $50,000 into their house before selling it. They have that money liquid and they don't have to do a HELOC or a cash out refi and all those types a of things. A bridge loan, yeah. Which yeah, only adds to the expense. Can. This is a no yeah, cost that's loan, people. That's so cool. So cool. Yeah, yeah super cool. Uh, you know, Compass does offer bridge loans, which is pretty, unique as well if you run that situation where your house is not ready it's not on the market and you just find the one online randomly one day we can still make it happen but you know there's definitely costs incurred to that don't recommend it unless you really need to do it yeah agreed and we feel the same way about bridge lending um yeah kind of a last resort sort of thing um but okay so there are a thousand reasons that i can think of of why somebody might want to talk to you andrew how do we yeah. get a hold of you uh, so you can find me on any social media. Um, Instagram's Andrew Glover 303. My personal cell, and I kept the Chicago number, couldn't get rid of it, had it since I was a kid, is 847-363-9232 if you want to send me an email. It's andrew.goldberg at compass.com. Okay, so on that note, somebody did make a comment on the video about how old I am. Thank you, Lindsay. And I would like to put out there that there was no such thing as having a cell phone number when I was a kid. <laughs> there were no cell phones when I was a kid. All right, so Andrew, thank you. Um, I, I would suspect that Jen would like to, to have you on the show again. Um, it's always amazing <laughs> to me how quickly a half hour goes when we're having a great conversation. Uh, I know. I, I didn't realize it was over until you're like, "Hey, man, how do we find him?" Yeah, oh, how do we? Yeah, how do we? Because uh, yeah, I feel like Russ uh, on the table. Yeah, and for those of you listening, yeah, uh, obviously Andrew's done great things as a local real estate agent. He's done some immeasurable research on different companies making that change. I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, let you pick his brain on that. And yeah, if you're in this market and you want to take advantage of this concierge program, I would recommend it. This is one of the coolest things that uh, Jen and I have heard tale of recently. 
um, in the real estate game, no question. Uh, what am I missing, Jen? I mean, I'm sure we could dive into a whole nother hour with Andrew. Oh, so. easy. <laughs> but we'll get you back on the show. Do, uh, episode two with me. I'm more than happy to do it. All right. We and will do that. We are booked to the end of 2021. Wow. Uh, no, you guys got me out. Like, <laughs> hey, I was like six or seven months. I was like, they're on it. I love it. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. yeah. The price of fame, I guess. All right. Let's <laughs> let's do a little bit of self-serving shit um, just because we're good at that. Uh, for those of you uh, watching, you can use that text code at the bottom of your screen if you're just listening to the podcast. And that is text TIPS to 63566. Um, I assume that'll ping you back all kinds of stuff like other episodes of How I Met Your Mortgage. Uh, our weekly video blog, the weekly little tip. Uh, give you the link to get a copy of my book, Just the Tips. Uh, what else, Jen? We got information on there about next year's Mile High Mastermind. Yeah, along with the links to the podcast on Apple and Spotify. And links to the podcast. All right. So, yeah, that's about as much self-serving content as we'll put <laughs> out there in any episode of How I Met Your Mortgage. But, again, Andrew, thank you. This has been a fantastic episode for us. No, it's been great. It's actually great to actually get to know you and actually have a live conversation with you. Yeah, I think that we'll get <laughs> to do it again. And hopefully we'll get to do it again before we actually have you back on the show. Yeah, 100% agree. Let's make it happen. All right. So I'm going to run our extra, Andrew, extra, Andrew, is that what we're calling it, Jen? The extra? Yes. All right. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, don't go anywhere. Um, and we will see all of you next week for another episode of How I Met Your Mortgage.